Romans chapter 4, reading from verse 1. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this the blessing then? only for the circumcised or for also for the uncircumcised for we say that faith was counted to abraham as righteousness how then was it counted to him was it before or after he had been circumcised it was not after but before he was circumcised he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the, the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the, the heir to, of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised him from, raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Amen. Let's just ask the Lord to be with us. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you're a great God. And we pray that you'll help us now as we look at your word for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, um, it was a long reading. Um, it's very difficult, you know, sometimes to know what to cut out. And the more you think you can cut something out, you think, do you know what? You're not doing justice um, to the word. So our text tonight is Romans chapter four, verse 21. That was a verse that Vakir gave me and saying that we're looking at um, a whole series of God is able. And um, whenever you see anything where it talks about God is able, get excited because I tell you it really is wonderful I'm pleased that we're going through um, this I think we did something very similar earlier on in the year um, doxologies and I really found it a great blessing to my own soul so it's great we've got another great one just to say um, uh, the main thing is going to look at the promise but it's just important just before I look at three things funny enough it's three things um, just to say, when Paul wrote this, Paul wrote this letter. Um, it was written, um, in, he was in Corinth at the time. And really, the church at Rome, they didn't know an awful lot about Paul. But 
he knew an awful lot about the church and what was going on. And if you look, for example, in chapter one and verse eight, um, it talks about in the world that the church was known for their faith. Chapter one and verse eight, um, chapter 16 and verse 19, it says how much the church was well known. So even though the church was well known um, and even though the church had great faith, they still needed to be grounded. And in a lot of cases, and you'll find this is why it mentions that the, the theme right through uh, the book of Romans, certainly in the earlier chapter, was Paul was saying to the people, um, you know, it's not about works. <laughs> Just because, you know, they were thinking that, you know, people like Abraham, who they had tremendous um, thought of, he was the father of the nations. And Paul almost throws an exocet in and he, he mentions later on about Abraham. And, you know, Paul, Paul was making the point that he was justified not by works, but by his faith in God. And for the people here, you know, they were, you know, it was more they were thinking, well, he's got lots to boast of because Abraham, our father of nation, he did lots and lots of things. But, you know, Paul had to rein them in. It's all of justification by faith. And it's faith alone in Christ alone or in God alone. And so really, um, you know, there's loads more I could say, but uh, I'm mindful that time is going. Um, but really, I want to stick to verse 21 and look at the whole idea of promise. What is a promise? And we're saying that God, our God, is able to um, keep his promise. Sadly, you and I don't. We've let people down, haven't we? Maybe we can think of times when we've messed up, when we've let people down. But what is a promise? It's interesting. If you were to look... Um, in a, um, a, a dictionary, you, you've got various de definition here. One says, talking about the noun of it, it says it's a declaration or assurance that one will do something or that a particular thing will, will happen. That's a noun. What about the verb of um, a promise? Well, it says here, assure something, assure someone that one will definitely do something or that something will be done. Well, when we're talking about God, we, you, you know, it's not a matter of a short, we know when God makes a promise, we can, we can hold on to that, can't we people? And what can we say? Well, I, I, I love the idea of a promise, but I also like the idea of a covenant. Now we know of two people in our church. Now, James and Joanna, come July the 16th, they're gonna make promises or covenant not just to one another, but in before God, they're going to make a covenant, an agreement that they're going to promise to um, do various things. And um, we're looking forward to that day, but it's going to be a promise that they'll make. And with God's help that they will keep. Now, when God makes a promise and or a covenant, and I think both of those are quite interlinked, because when God makes a, makes a covenant, he bounds himself to his people. What a wonderful thought. So God, if he makes a promise, yes, and I'll keep intertwining them because I think they're both link. If he makes a promise or this covenant of he bounds himself to, to his people to keep his promise. And he and this is demonstrated right throughout history, as we know. And what we're going to do very briefly, we're going to look at three things, but we're going to look at Abraham, because he's the one that's mentioned, isn't he? And we know about Abraham. So if we have the first slide, we're going to look three things concerning God's promise to Abraham. And the first one, it says here, God is able to do what he has promised. I wonder if that is true of you. God is able to do what he has promised. And the first point is this. Abraham believed he did not waver. Look at verse Look at verse 20 of Romans chapter 4. And I love this. It says, No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. No unbelief made him waver. That's Abraham. Now turn with me. Yes, we, we've got to turn to 
Genesis, haven't we? Now, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 11, because most people just go straight to Genesis chapter 12. But his name was Abram at this time. His name was changed later on as God was dealing more with him and blessing him. God's changed um, his name to Abraham. But at this point, his name was Abram. And our first point, don't forget what we're saying, he did not waver. Right, let's go to um, Genesis 11, verse 31, because it starts there. We usually start at chapter 12, don't we? So um, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Aran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur, of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Aaron, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Aaron. Now, chapter 12. Sometimes the chapters, as we know, are not always in order, um, but we'll go to chapter 12. And this is the point just I want us to focus on. Abraham believed he did not wa waver. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And this is it. Let's take hold of this people, everybody. And I will make of you a great nation. Promise number one, a great nation. Number two, and I will bless you. Isn't that good? What a thought to think that God said, I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Isn't that lovely? Now, that's God's promise. And what have we said about a promise? That God, he, he binds himself to his people. What a promise for Abraham. But it goes on. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Boy, boy, what a promise. We'll leave it there just for a moment. Well, what a task. How old was Abraham? Well, I think he was 75 years old. And we say, reverently he wasn't a spring chicken but the lord called him abraham abraham i want you to go and what do we find verse four so abraham excuse me if you find me saying abraham when i should be saying abraham at certain points but there we are verse four so abraham went as the lord had told him and lot with him Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Aaron. Straight away, he believed God. He obeyed God. I wonder how it is for us. There are times in our lives when God wants us to do things or go somewhere or we get challenges even. Even in the challenges of this life, our God, he wants us to trust him. Why? Because he's got the best for us and he wants the best for us. Even sometimes we can't always see it. You know, you'd have thought, why, Lord? Why? No, no excuses there. You know, he just got up and go. It says in my Bible, he did not waver. And, you know, so often, don't we, if we're honest, we waver. We think, Lord, you know, do you really want me to do this? Lord, you know, why? Why do you really want me to go? And it meant for him, leaving his way of life, all the things he had got settled. You know, some of us, you know, you, you think in your homes, maybe, um, you know, if <laughs> occasionally Sarah and I would think, Oh, dear me, you know, we're getting older now and uh, maybe some of you are not thinking quite like that. We think, dear me, should we move? Should we stay where we are? And you think, oh, no, too much hassle. Oh, can't be bothered to move. And you think of all the things that you've got to get up and go and you think, no, 
and you think, well, you're rattling around and other times you think, well, actually, no, because it's great when the family can come back and you think you don't want anything smaller because how will you get the family in? And you go on and on and on. But just the idea of getting up and move, it's a big upheaval. And you think for Abraham, it was all the cattle, all the, all the, all, you know, everything. It was a whole lot. But he trusted God. He did not waver. And I love that. So um, Romans 4 again. Let's just read it. Verse 20. It says here, just go to verse 20. Um, it says here, no unbelief made him waver. We've all got to be careful, haven't we? Unbelief can get in the way. And when unbelief get in the way, let's be honest, it will cause us to waver and even to doubt God. And God has made a promise and he'll keep that promise. So that's the first point. OK, let's have a look at the, um, the second slide now for our second point. And our second point is this. Abraham believed he was strengthened in his faith. How was he strengthened in his faith? Now, I want you now to look at the second part of um, chapter, verse 20. So he, um, Romans again, we're back to Romans. So it says that the first part, no one believed made him waver concerning the promise of God. But then it goes on, but he grew strong in his faith. That's lovely. How are you doing? How are we all doing? We get the waves. We get the, the, the storms. And we think, where is God? And, you know, sometimes we think like, you know, like foot, footprints. You're familiar with that. You think, Lord, you know, why am I going through this? Lord, what's happening? Where are you, Lord? And we think the Lord's deserted us, but he's not deserted us. He's there. He's holding us in his hand and he wants us to keep strong in the faith and not to waver. And I really love this. And this was the, the secret, sure, certainly, for Abraham at this time. We say, but verse 20 again, the second part, it's lovely. But he grew strong in his faith. As he gave God, as he gave glory. And in keeping strong in his faith, but still with Abraham, because again, we're going to look at another example. And some of these are familiar. You all know some of this. And let's have a look at a, another example. Um, Genesis chapter 22. Now, I find this as a parent pretty tough, pretty hard. Um, and we're making the point, Ab Abraham, or Abraham, <laughs> he believed he was strengthened in his faith. Look at Genesis 22. Again, it's familiar. I needn't get involved, lost in all the details, but we, we know verse 1, Genesis 22. After these things, God tested Abraham. It's important. It's got the word tested, not tempt. God doesn't tempt anybody. God tests us, yes, in his infinite mercy and sovereignty. He allows us to go so far and then he comes in. But he, here we have, he tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, this is now when his name's changed. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. I don't know about you, but this is quite, when you read it, it sounds absolutely shocking at first. You read it and you think, Lord, is this, you know, what's happening? We all know how much Abraham, as it was that he loved Isaac. Isaac was his only son. Isaac was the heir. 
following on from Abraham, wasn't he? He was in the line. What is God saying? And look how it's rubbed in. You know, when I say rubbed in, you look at verse two, because he, but God really rubs it in, in the fact that it was his only son and how much he loved him. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. Boy, yeah, God, he, God gets to the heart of the matter. Whom you love and go to the land of Moriah. What a command. What would it, what did Abraham do? Well, in my Bible here, it doesn't talk about any arguments. Is there? No argument. Look at verse three. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And then it goes on to describe what he did. What faith? What faith? He believed God. He was obedient to God. And in the same chapter, if we read on further on, well, again, we're, it's a familiar story. We're, we're all familiar with it. We know it got to the point where even his son asked him, what are you doing? Where's the sacrifice? His son says, you know, if you um, look from verse six onwards, and Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on, on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they both went off and they both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, sorry. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the wood and the fire. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? What a question. Quite right. Absolutely. He hit the, hit the nail, we say. But where is it? And look at Abraham's answer. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. It's interesting. He used the word lamb. <laughs> he used the word lamb. And we know the story later on, how a lamb was caught in the thicket. And again, what does that point us to? Christ, the ultimate sacrifice. But that's for another time. I can't get into that. But Abraham here, he was obedient to God. And his strength and his faith was strengthened. But then... Having said all this about his faith, having said all this about Abraham, there were times as well when even Abraham, he wasn't as obedient as he should have been. There were some turning points, wasn't there? Now, I've said that his faith was strengthened. I said, he, it was great, you know, about his faith and so on. But what about with Sarah, his wife, when we find when God appeared to him in Genesis um, chapter 17 and God appeared and even talked with him and talked about Sarah having the son. I know I've gone the other way around deliberately. Um probably would have started with Isaac being born. I thought, no, I'm going to do it deliberately this way around. Sarah laughed, Genesis chapter 18 and verse 12, when she heard that she was going to have a son named Isaac. She laughed. You must be joking. I'm too old. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 17, Abraham, yet yeah, completely wavered. He, he didn't want to believe it. I'm 99 years old. He says, how can I have a son? It's impossible. So he wavered. He didn't believe. Now, I started off with the positive. <laughs> then there's a bit of negative. So we've got to even, you know, we have all this thing. We have all this down here to warn us, to warn us all that even people like Abraham, great faith. Ultimately, we don't just look to Abraham. We look to Abraham's God, don't we? And it's a reminder to us all how careful we must be 
there go all of us but by the grace of God never think something will never happen to you oh I'll never laugh at God I'll never sin in that way have you heard about that Christian oh that would never happen to me be careful be careful and we've all got to watch it the devil's real and he's ready to pounce as soon as he's able and as ever he can so let's watch it Yes, his faith was strengthened. Yes, he had times in his life when he didn't trust God as he ought to have done. Like his wife, um, he doubted. His wife laughed. He wavered. But we've got to trust God. Remember what we said at the start. When God makes his promises, he's able to keep it. Why? Because he has bound himself to his people. What a, what a comfort. That should certainly, certainly um, encourage us all. And because of Abraham's faith, it was all accounted to him as righteousness because of his faith. And this is the whole point that Paul was trying to make in Romans chapter four, you know, to the Romans, to the people there, you know, it's not by works we're saved. It's through faith. Yes, that faith that drives you to want to work for God. That faith that God gives you that makes you want to follow him. So Abraham believed and he was strengthened. But then thirdly, if we could have the next slide, um, please, um, James. Abraham believed. God fulfilled his promises. He did. God fulfilled his promises. Um, how did God fulfill his promises? What happened? Well, we know how much Abraham, how his family, his line, they were blessed. They multiplied, you know, right throughout generation. And it, it's sad now, but when you think um, when God first called him to the land of Canaan, the land of promise, um, over in Canaan, known as Israel now, and we think of Israel and all the things that's happening, even on our TV, it's it's quite sad, all the, the, the fighting and all, all the things, and we need to pray for that land, that God will really um, have his own way, Gentiles and Jews, and this is what makes the gospel so wonderful, that this promise that God's given, um, it's not just to the Jews, but it's to the Gentiles, like you and me, we're Gentiles, aren't we? Because we're not Jews and we've got this great gospel. And this is the gospel when Paul came to the people at Rome, um, you know, in Romans chapter one and verse 16, it says, what did he say there? As much as in me is, what a tongue twister. I'm ready to preach the gospel. What a gospel the Lord's given to us that he wants us to preach, to make known. But until that time, um, we must continue to want to serve God, to follow him. And look how God fulfilled his promises in blessing, in multiplying um, Abraham's family. And it's recorded for us in, in Hebrews chapter 11, don't we? You know, the, the great, the heroes of faith, he's amongst them, he's there. And God can use even me, even you in his service. And let's not doubt his promise. Let's believe it. And, you know, we want to be like Abraham, certainly be fully persuaded to want to follow God. And this is why I, I love um, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. It says, now, now, look, now unto him who is able to do far more exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, you know, let's not limit God. Often we, we limit him. You know, your mind is finite. You know, we can only go so far. We're talking about a God who is infinite. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. And God will can fulfill his promises in us. Let's, you know, I put a note here. Don't, um, don't trust your works, but only in the finished work of Christ on the cross. You know, our works is, will soon be burnt up. It's, what, what is it? The, the best that we can do, the Bible says, it's as filthy rags before God. But we've got a God who 
what, what some of the promises I've listed loads of promises here you know I will be with you Matthew 28 verse 20 you know maybe you're, you're dreading this week you're dreading your appointment this coming week you're something that's niggling at the back of your mind well God says I will be with you don't forget what we said at the start God promised he's going to bound himself to your people come on let's all take hold of it you know we could all be down in the in the dumps as it were I will be with you Matthew 28 verse 20 oh there's a few others I will protect you second Th Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3 I will be your strength we need it don't we every single day I will be your strength Philippians 4 verse 13 I will provide for you Philippians 4 verse 19 yes I know I'm giving loads of scriptures it's, it's lovely it's great and then however you feel this afternoon it says here what a promise I have loved you with an everlasting love Jeremiah 31 verse 3 boy how can we be down how can we not claim these promises whatever your lot tonight that, that, that I think of that hymn of that song thou hast taught me it is well it is well with my soul and that's my prayer for all of us that we'll be able to say it is well with our soul why because we are fully persuaded <laughs> that totally convinced that what God said he will do he will do he will do it and let's not allow unbelief to get in the way Amen. Amen. Well, let us pray. Dear Lord, we pray that you'll help us to really have meant what we've just sung, to stand on every promise of your word. Though the going may be tough, though the valleys may seem quite dark, we thank you that we have a God who says to us all tonight, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Thank you, Lord, that you love us and we can claim the promises even when unbelief comes in. Lord, you have promised never, never to leave us. Help me, help us all to take that to heart even tonight. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, may the Lord bless you all and um, we'll see you all a bit later. If you...